So right there in the middle is my dad when he was 16, about 40 years ago. He lived in a village where his family for several generations made a living through farming. He started working on the family farm when he was only 12 years old. Occasionally he'd go to school where he did all his work on a slate in blistering heat. There was no seating, so his entire class sat on a hard floor the entire day. Access to education for him and his colleagues was quite limited, and the quality was extremely poor. Today, everyone in his family, including most of my cousins and nephews, still live in that village. All of them are farmers, and they struggle to make ends meet. They have little, if any, access to education. Oddly enough, my dad was the first in his family to not only graduate high school, but to also obtain several university degrees. He then went on to work with Nobel laureates in economics and served the government of India for years. You know, I, I often ask him about how all this happened, right? I try to make sense of it. How did he manage to escape a fate that 99% of his peers couldn't? Maybe he had a drive and willingness to persevere through adversity that others did not. Perhaps he got lucky. I don't really know. But what I do know is that not everyone in a situation, that most people in a situation weren't as fortunate as he was. Now, out of modesty, my dad doesn't take credit for being courageous. He instead resorts to the I could have been lucky argument. He tells me that no one in our village lacks courage, and I believe him when he says that. What they lack, he tells me, are academic resources, qualified instructors, properly fortified curriculums, and so on. What they lack, he says, is a quality education. Now, this is why education is something I've spent a ton of time thinking about. It's really an attempt to understand how we can accelerate accessibility while sustaining quality. This is not a mere matter of providing further internet access or improving education technology. Those things are important, but they're definitely not enough. Far from it, actually. Now, the reality is that the playing field in education isn't leveled. Just as a middle class was formed largely as a consequence of democratizing knowledge through the invention of the printing press, democratizing quality education will be a byproduct of increasing its accessibility. That's the key. Now, I'm sure that everyone here has probably heard a debate or a speech or read an article on education reform. The reality is that mainstream topics on education are all over the place. Now, not because they're unimportant or irrelevant, they are. But it's just the way education is. It is all over the place. After all, if you think about it, a small systemic change in education can have a ripple effect that impacts almost every single function in our society. Now, debates and discussions have ranged from what a classroom should look like and how teachers should be assessed, all the way to reevaluating the role of standardized testing. Now, there's also a school of thought that believes that in our lifetime, education will undergo a monumental shift pushed by technological breakthroughs. But a topic, or really a theme, that's often overlooked when we think about education, and particularly educational accessibility, is the unbundling, the unbundling of education and social breakthroughs. I think these two components combined will transform the future of education. So let's talk about them one by one and see how they fit together. Let's first talk about unbundling. Now, unbundling is the idea that consumers, that over time, consumers will only choose what they need and products will be created around their increasingly specific demands. It's kind of a basic evolutionary thing. Bundling and unbundling of products and services is probably the most common trend in the history of computing. Let's take some examples just so we can illustrate the concept. Years ago, we could only purchase full music albums, even if we only wanted to listen to one out of 15 songs. Today, we can purchase individual songs instead of full music albums, right? Another example, a few dozen major national magazines are now fragmented into thousands of specialty magazines, which are further fragmented into millions of blogs and sites. Basically, the BS answer is people are looking to consume what they want and block out anything they consider a waste of their personal resources. So let's think about unbundling now in the context of education. How is this related to education? Universities bundle services like crazy. I mean, think about that for a sec. The bundles are actually massive. 
There are courses, academic research, credentials, housing, food, athletic programs, job placements, extracurriculars, the art, studying abroad, social life. The list just keeps going on, right? Historically, in contrast to other industries like software, brick and mortar education institutions have added more services and products to their already massive bundles. So the point is, large bundles in education limit choice. They limit choice. But we want the opposite, right? We want choice. We want choice. This is fundamentally why unbundling is taking place in education right now. This is also why many people agree that unbundling seems to be an extraordinarily powerful force that is sure to change the future of education. But unbundling alone, alone, can't reform education. What's needed is a combination of unbundling and something I refer to as social breakthroughs, which we'll get to in a bit. But first, but first, before I explain what a social breakthrough in this context even is, let's try to understand why there's a need for social breakthroughs through digging a little bit deeper. We can isolate post-secondary education, university education, into components I call the core four. These components, if integrated into a brick-and-mortar institution alternative, could result in an educational breakthrough. An educational breakthrough is something I define as an offering or product that eliminates the need for a student to rely on any existing brick and mortar institution, because that's fundamentally what we need to level the playing field. Now, these core four components, what are they? Figurehead, the content, employer recognition, and the social factor. Now, figurehead, the figurehead and the content, the first two, basically consist of the instructor delivering and explaining the content to the students. It's a fundamental idea we've practiced for hundreds of years in education. Employer recognition is critical because it essentially directs the university strategy. This is important. Let's consider this for a sec. If employers employ a large chunk of a certain university's graduates, suddenly and collectively change their requirements, what would happen? What would happen? Universities would have to realign their strategies accordingly, otherwise they would risk losing their competitive edge, right? Now the fourth one, the social factor, is the social interaction between all members of the university community that makes a post-secondary experience so unique. It's possibly the reason why the idea of attending brick-and-mortar institutions has been sustained for hundreds of years. So to summarize, let's take a bird's eye view of everything we've covered. An educational breakthrough consists of a brick and mortar alternative, an alternative that offers an integration of the figurehead, the content, employer recognition, and the social factor. Now, I emphasize brick and mortar alternative because democratizing education through brick and mortar is simply unfeasible due to high costs and limitations on educational resources and a whole bunch of other reasons. But this is what's interesting. This is what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen. While some companies are making attempts to provide alternatives to brick and mortar to make an educational breakthrough as we defined it, none of them, none of them have succeeded. This is because the best any organization has accomplished is unbundling courses into lectures and not universities into courses. Why? Because any existing solution, such as MOOCs or massively open online courses, integrate only the first three of the core four components we talked about. That is, the figurehead, the content, and employer recognition. But they do not integrate the final component, the social factor. That's the difference between unbundling a course into a lecture and a university into a course. The latter, the latter requires integrating all four core components we talked about into a brick and mortar alternative. This would lead to an educational breakthrough. It would allow us to unbundle universities into alternatives that would truly democratize high-quality education. Without this, we just can't run the playing field. And without an educational breakthrough, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we, we just, it's, it's unfeasible. We can't level the playing field. So, now startups like Udacity and Coursera, which are two ad tech companies, they've accomplished really amazing stuff. What they've accomplished is commendable but they have still yet to solve the social factor issue. In other words, they need to create a social breakthrough. 
This is not a critique by any means, but it's a verification of the fact that accomplishing this is excruciatingly difficult. Even Y Combinator, one of the world's best seed funds, seems to agree. In their request for startups list, which is essentially their version of ideas they think will impact the future in the most profound way, they said this. Solutions that combine the mass scale of technology with one-on-one -on -one in person interaction. This may not require te breakthrough technology in the classical sense, but at the minimum, but at the minimum, it will require a new way of doing things. So that's the holy grail. That's the holy grail. Offering courses that not only lead to accreditations and recognition by employers, provide great course content, contain a competent instructor, but also offer other components that prevail in the offline world, especially, especially the social factor. So well, the obvious follow-up question to this is, well, how do you create the social factor thing, right? How do you create the social factor thing? This is a question I've been trying to answer, but still haven't completely succeeded. But I think fundamentally, the social factor is a byproduct of making social breakthroughs. This is key, which for ease of understanding, social breakthroughs are divided into social discoveries and social inventions. There's no distinct line that separates social inventions from social discoveries. So to navigate this really gray area, let's take a look at a couple of recent examples. Let's take Airbnb, which I'm guessing a lot of you have used here, as an example of a social discovery. Okay? Airbnb taps into what humans are innately unwilling to do, letting strangers live in their home. Before Airbnb, most of us were unaware that the idea of having strangers pay for a living space in our homes would be acceptable given the conventions of humanity. People are skeptical about any, any activity on the internet that involves a stranger, right? At least I am. Most of the time, not all. But letting someone live in your house that you've never met before, oftentimes without your presence, seemed like a really far stretch. This is why Airbnb was actually considered one of the worst startup ideas in Silicon Valley in the company's early days. Today, today, it's one of the most important companies in the world. So that's social discoveries. That's social discovery. On the other hand, when, we, when a means to engage in some form of common behavior, a common behavior was previously non-existent, but eventually became available, a company's founding could be called a social invention. Uber could be considered a social invention. Before Uber, many people already carpooled. Many were used to the idea of giving strangers rides in return for a fee. But this process was largely informal. Uber came along and formalized it through its robust infrastructure. That's what Uber fundamentally is. A formalized process we already sort of were used to engaging in. In all these cases, while technology can help accelerate change, it does not define it. What sets the tone for radical innovations in these cases are social breakthroughs. Social breakthroughs. Now, when we look at education, there's been very little done from a social invention and social discovery standpoint. Most change in education today, at least in the technology world, is in the form of leveraging technology to amplify existing social conventions. In other words, the social factor aspect hasn't been achieved. MOOCs are classroom lectures blown up at scale. There's an instructor and there are students. But as we discussed, there's one thing missing. Although the fundamental form of interaction is the same as it was hundreds of years ago in education, the social factor, the social interaction is missing. So, looking back, a social breakthrough consists of figuring out how to create, create the social factor or social interaction in a way that is sustainable. And successful unbundling will integrate all of the core four components we discussed in any given brick and mortar alternative. Alternative, that's key. Because it's the only way to truly achieve an educational breakthrough. Now, I wanted to leave you with one last thought. A little while back, I came across an interview of Professor Vijay Pandey of Stanford University. It reminded me of my dad. Professor Pandey visited a village several years ago that his dad grew up in. Professor Pandey said, this village has thatched huts and dirt floors, and only one building has running water. 
And it's, where, and it's where I would be now if my father hadn't gone to college. I walked into one of the huts, and there's a little teenage boy going over a textbook. It was Halliday and Wesley, which is the same physics textbook that Princeton used when I was there. When I read this, it reminded me how easily anyone in this room, anyone, anyone at all, could be in that boy's situation. It reminded me of what my dad told me about everyone he grew up with, that they did not lack courage, but rather a quality education. It reminded me that not everyone, and perhaps not even the boy the professor's talking about, end up as fortunate or lucky or whatever you want to call it, as my dad was. Finally, it reminded me that, not, that one of the greatest challenges today's generation faces, one of the greatest challenges we face, is democratizing high quality education by making it more globally accessible. Let's face and overcome that challenge together. Mm -hmm.